a carbon tax election. That was the call from Conservative leader Pierre Polyev and the House of Commons. Of course, the vote failed. There is not going to be a carbon tax election, not yet anyway. Hello, I'm Brian Lilly. Welcome to the Full Comment Podcast. There has been utter chaos over the last little while on Parliament Hill. And the real question that we have to answer is whether the Trudeau government can get themselves back on track or is Pierre Polyev's steam train just going to keep on rolling around the bend, as Johnny Cash would say. Lauren Gunter is a columnist with the Toronto Sun, the Edmonton Sun. If you've been paying attention to politics for the last 30 years, you've read them somewhere. National Post, Edmonton Journal, all over the place. And he joins me now for this discussion. Lauren, um, very strange last week in politics uh, up on Parliament Hill. You and I watching from afar, but with great interest, as uh, Polyev dares the prime minister to, to call a carbon tax election. Yeah, and, and why not? I mean, I, that dare plus the uh, idea of holding a non-confidence vote was not really about triggering election. I'm guessing the Conservatives uh, knew that, that none of their pleas would lead to an election. None of their maneuvers would lead to an election. But this enabled them to get the other three parties in the Commons, the Liberals, the Bloc, and the NDP, all to seem to side with the carbon tax. And so, uh, you know, on any issue in, in, in politics, if if the public is split 50-50 and you're the only only party on one side and the other three are, are splitting the other 50%, you have a huge advantage. In this case, it's about a 70-30 split and the yeah. Conservatives are now the only party on the 70% side, I mean, it, 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 it is good maneuvering. It, it wasn't going to lead to an election. I had people texting me all last night and some this morning. Somebody, oh, what happened in the, the confidence vote? I, are we in an election? No, that was never going to happen. <laughs> Calm yourselves down. But now Polyev can go to the electorate whenever the election comes about and say, hey, look, we're the only party who wanted to save you from the carbon tax. If you want the carbon tax kept the same or eliminated, we're the only option you have. Everybody else is in favor of increasing that tax year after year after year. And, and I think it's good politics. So the, there were two votes. There was the vote on Wednesday, which was to um, spike the hike. I mean, <clears throat> great branding from Polyev. Yep. I got to yep. say that. Great branding. Spike the hike and ax the tax. Uh, the Liberals dismiss this as bumper sticker politics. Well, first off, we're Canadians. We don't do bumper <laughs> sticker politics. Go visit, go visit the States, right? We all visit the States at some point. They love their bumper stickers and they're all over. But what these are are easy to remember slogans. And so they had the vote on Wednesday saying to the government, 70% of Canadians are opposed to the tax. And that's borne out by Alege Paul. We want to be fully accurate. 69% oppose the, uh, the carbon tax and seven out of 10 premiers. And Polyev stood up in the House of Commons on Wednesday ahead of that vote and just kept reading off all these different people. Well, the liberal opposition in New Brunswick is opposed to the carbon tax. Are you the liberal opposition and the NDP opposition in Nova Scotia voted unanimously with the conservative government of Nova Scotia against the carbon tax hike? Will you, uh, even the Ontario liberal leader, he wouldn't say her name, Bonnie Crombie, uh, she has come out against the carbon tax. And Trudeau just kept standing up and saying, no, this, this will make life more affordable for you. This is an affordability <laughs> measure. Do you uh, think it, that has any resonance with anyone? No. And you want to know how deep the opposition goes. We are currently in the middle of a leadership race to replace Rachel Notley as the NDP leader in Alberta. And there are six declared candidates, two of whom have already come out and said they're against the carbon tax. So if you okay, get to are the they point against where, the carbon tax or the hike? No, they're against the carbon tax. <laughs> so even so, the Alberta NDP is against it now, or yeah, at least part of it. Part of it is. And so, you know, you've got nobody on the prime minister's side except a few diehard liberals who would defend him uh, even if even if incriminating evidence were found about what he'd done on his Jamaica trip. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's just those blind loyalists. It's the sycophants. They're the only ones who are left in favor of this. And, and you know, a, a, a few activists who don't own cars and bike 
14 blocks to their job at the nonprofit in downtown Vancouver who aren't affected by this because the weather isn't bad there, who, who don't have to pay their home heating bills in, in northern Ontario or northern Alberta in the middle of January when we had that cold snap that went down to minus 35 and minus 40. We had one I, night here yeah, in Edmonton where it was minus 50. How did your heat pump work that night? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Was, was I got, it good? I got all sorts of photos from people in Nova Scotia when that yeah. big snowstorm hit uh, the maritime provinces. And uh, all sorts of people sent me these photos of their heat pump encased in frozen snow unable then to bring in air and then pump out heat in the house. And so the two or three of them said, we're glad that we kept our wood burning stove because at least we were able to stay somewhat warm. So it's funny you mentioned that our, uh, our colleague at the Toronto sun, Warren Kinsella writes columns for us, mm -hmm. um, you know, former liberal, N never call him a liberal anymore because he says he's not with this current tribe, but uh, Kinsella uh, built a cabin. Uh, up in, it's not quite Northern Ontario, it's Eastern Ontario um, and near Minden. And he's written about this. He put in a heat pump, you know, it, you're out in the, the wilds, you're, you're not connected, you're not gonna get a natural gas line where he's got his cabin. And so he puts in a heat pump and he's up there in the winter and it conks out. And he calls the guy that installed it. And he's like, well, hey, this thing's not working. What am I gonna do? And he said, of course it's not working. It's below minus 25. He said, well, I'm here. I got to stay warm. What am I going to do? And he said, you see that black box down next to you, the wood stove? Light it. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah exactly. Exactly. I mean, I mean, it, on, on, the, on the government's own website, on Natural Resources Canada's own website, until very recently, there was discussion of all sorts of different kinds of home heating, you know, wood burning stoves and natural gas furnaces and, and fireplaces and heat pumps. And on Natural Resources Canada's own site, it said these don't work particularly well below about minus 15. And now that, you know, we're pumping, we're, the federal government is pushing heat pumps on everyone everywhere in the country, that's been removed from the Natural Resources I, website. I, I live in a, a veritable Shangri-La of <laughs> warmth compared to you. You're out in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. I'm in downtown Toronto where we rarely see snow. Um, and so a heat pump would work here and mm. you see them all over the place, uh, walking around on homes on, you know, I live near the U of T campus walking through there. You see them on some of the buildings, you know, it's like electric vehicles. They make sense in some instances, mm -hmm. but not others, but Justin mm -hmm. Trudeau, you know, this has become part of his big thing of saving the carbon tax. Let's, let's get back to the carbon yep. tax, Lauren. Yep. Um, yeah. Is this an albatross around Trudeau's neck? Can he salvage this? You know, I was seeing uh, Max Fawcett, who's a columnist for one of the socialist websites, I think it's The Observer, and even he was saying, the carbon tax is dead. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, figure out something else for climate change. Yep. Is this thing just done and, and it's like the Monty Python dead parrot sketch? They don't want to admit it? Right. I think that's a very good analogy. I do think it's a dead, a dead parrot. And, uh, and it's because what they fail to understand, whether it's the liberal government or the environmental movement, is that Canadians have said time and again, they'll pay up to about $250 extra over a year for environment saving processes, equipment, whatever. You know, if, if an EV was uh, $150 more than uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle and the heat pump was $100 more than a natural gas furnace, well, there'd be your two things. They'd buy a heat pump and, and, uh, and an EV and spend the extra 250 But we're talking here about things that, especially with EVs, you're talking about one that's on average somewhere between ten and $12,000 more than an internal combustion engine. And with heat pumps, now you're talking about something that in much of the country simply is inadequate. Like, okay, so fine. Out of a 52-week year, maybe it would work for 45 weeks here in Edmonton, in northern Alberta. Uh, but mm -hmm. what are you going to do for the other seven weeks? I mean, you, those are the worst seven weeks of the year. You, 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 you go to Arizona. All go to Mexico, you know, exactly. <laughs> and I, I guess that's what they're thinking is going to happen. But it is, it is just based on such 
fantastical thinking. It's, it, 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 it makes sense to them on paper. I remember using this analogy one time. When I was a kid, about eight or 10 years old, I used to draw up these battle plans, you know, this army and that army. And my army always won because I could control all the variables and I could give myself the extra tanks and the extra soldiers. And, and that's basically how Environment Canada does its studies on electric vehicles and heat pumps and how they will work. They they control all the variables. I remember Blacklock's reporter caught them about a year and a half ago, putting out a tender for consultants who could prove that EVs were cheaper over their lifetimes than an internal combustion engine that's not how you do a study. You, you say, look, we want to see which one's better, which one has lower costs over its entire lifetime, EV or ICE. You don't say we are looking for consultants who can show us that EVs are cheaper, that that's, that's the goal of the report. And that's where they're at. They, they, they just they, they live in this world where they think all of this will work. And I don't trust any of the reports that the government itself puts out or that it pays consultants to put out. Uh, to show us that we are going to an electrified future for home heating and vehicles. Look, um, you and I have a bit of a different perspective on this. I'm uh, fine if the industry is going to go electric, and I live in Ontario, and that's a major industry. Of course, I want the manufacturing here, electric or otherwise. Um, but as far as the uses of EVs, in, in some instances, they make sense. Yep. Uh, you know, there's a plant just uh, maybe two hours west of where I'm sitting, Ingersoll, Ontario. And they use, it's the old Cami plant. They retrofitted it to make the, what they call bright drop. These are, they're kind of like the sprinter vans mm -hmm. uh, used by FedEx, UPS, all of that to deliver all the packages in urban settings. Guess what? They're EVs. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. But that doesn't make sense if you've got to drive something from Edmonton to Fort Mac or Saskatoon to Prince Albert or Thunder Bay to Kenora. Yeah, and it's not a matter of infrastructure. When you say these things and environmentalists overhear you saying them, they say, oh, well, yeah, it'll be fine once we get the infrastructure built. Once we get all the charging stations every five kilometers along the highways, that'll be, do you know how much that's going to cost? I mean, even if you could do that, it would still cost billions of dollars. And I don't see a private solution to that. So you're talking about taxpayers' billions. And we've already spent probably $200 billion in Canada on the, the Liberals' green fantasies. We look at, 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 at the accumulating national debt. People always say, well, that was because of the pandemic. No, no, no it wasn't. It, it's because this government will spend on any green initiative that comes by, and they will throw hundreds of millions and billions upon billions. I mean, starting to sound like Carl Sagan. They, the billions and billions of stars. Uh, well, they will spend billions and billions of dollars on, on making their green fantasies reality. And there's just no way at this moment you can do it. I, I have often said in, in, uh, in, in print and in video, I don't care what powers my vehicle. I don't. I have no particular love affair with the internal combustion engine. For its time, it was a technological marvel. But if you look at an electric car, some of them are the most elegant technological vehicles ever created, and they are now among the world's fastest vehicles. I don't care if it's electric, but it has to go as far as my internal combustion engine does. I can go about 900 k on a tank of gas. It has to be rechargeable in the same amount of time. I used to go from here in Edmonton to Vancouver to visit our son when he was in university and make one stop in 1,100 kilometers. And that was in a place called Blue River, BC. I could fuel up, run in and get a, a, a drink and a snack and be back on the road in under 15 minutes. So you have to go as far as my internal combustion engine. You have to recharge as fast as I can refuel. And it has to work in the winter. Because we get that's a lot of winter in this right country, now. and so far that's not happening. I'm with you. If the market thinks we can go to EVs, if if all the major manufacturers suddenly want to switch from ICEs to EVs, and they think they can get the same level of sales, they can bring it down to the same price level if they make enough of them. You know, you you you, you get you get the. the economy of scale. He said, if, if, if that happens, fine. I don't care. You can, you can fuel my car with bug burps. I don't care. 
It just <laughs> has to be. Don't give them ideas. <laughs> well, that, that, that'll keep them busy for another 30 years. But, the, but at least, it, but it has to work the way the machine I have now works. So, you know, when, when I go down to the States, um, places like Florida and California, you see a lot more EVs than you do mm -hmm. up here, mm -hmm. even than you do in Toronto. Yep. And there's a simple reason for that. They have the range that you're talking about. I, I still don't think the charging, the charging uh, technology is there. It's not as fast as it needs to be, but there's at least the fact that you've got the range and, and that's due to the fact that it isn't freezing cold. Whether yep. it's heat pumps or EVs, just in, or bicycle lanes, Justin Trudeau wants us to all believe that we're living in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly. we're simply not. Yeah. Uh, so I, I once wrote that the, there were five, because the city of Edmonton is obsessed with bike lanes. It takes lanes out of traffic all the time and converts them to bicycles. And I said the five biggest causes, or the five biggest obstacles to bicycle transportation in Edmonton are November, December, January, February, and March. And because people <laughs> won't ride bikes in those, like, I, got, I get up early every morning, so I go out and clear off my, my sidewalk, because there are cyclists who go every day, 12 months of the year, past my house, and I like to have the sidewalk clean so that they have a, a safe place to ride. That's how committed I am to them. But I'm not joining them. I'm not January 15th when it was minus 32 and someone went riding by my house first thing in the morning. I'm not saying, hey, wait a minute, I'll get my bike and I'll come with you. I, I, I'm getting in my Jeep and I'm driving with the heater on. But you're like me. I, I, look, uh, I walk, I, I take the subway, I, I have a bike, I have a car. I'll use all modes of transportation. It's whatever makes sense at the time. Mm -hmm. But in the bitter cold and it's late March here in Toronto and suddenly we've got bitter cold and snow again, yep. I'm not going out there. Uh, let me just bring it back to the carbon tax stuff that mm -hmm. we were discussing earlier. Um, Justin Trudeau is very committed to the carbon tax, just like he's committed to all the other things we've been discussing. And, and he, you know, he's got a bit of a messianic complex. It's why he's not leaving anytime <laughs> soon, in my view. Uh, he's going to save us from climate change. He's going to save us from misinformation and disinformation. But also on the carbon tax, he is either convinced or doing a very good job of pretending he's convinced that we actually get back more than mm -hmm. it costs us. And, you know, for, Months now, Pierre Polyev has been standing up and citing the parliamentary budget officer's report from March 30th, 2023, which showed that in the provinces where the federal carbon tax is implemented, that when you add up all the costs, not just the mm -hmm. carbon tax, but the, the, the loss of income, the loss of economic opportunity, the higher prices that we pay that we don't get a rebate on, um, and the fact that the GST is charged on top of the carbon tax, that we're actually down significantly. Mm -hmm. it, most middle-class families are down significantly. And Trudeau keeps standing up and saying, no, that's not true, you get back more, and why would you take away these checks? This is an affordability issue. He's trying to frame this, these rebates, as this is how you deal with higher prices. I'll give you money back, ignoring the fact that part of the reason prices are higher, not the whole reason, but part of it is his tax. Exactly. And, you know, a really good example of that came out yesterday. Statistics Canada released its inflation figures for uh, the month of February. And inflation in Canada was down to 2.8% on an annual basis. That's pretty good. I mean, it should be a little lower than that, but that's, for the last couple of years, that's a pretty decent level. Mm-hmm. In Saskatchewan, it was 1.7%. And StatsCan says the reason that it's 1.1% lower in Saskatchewan than on the national average is that Saskatchewan is no longer permitting its crown utilities to charge the carbon tax on home heating. That's how big an impact the carbon tax has. Saskatchewan and we're takes about it to put off. It up. Exactly. Saskatchewan takes it off. It, it lowers their inflation rate by over a third and uh, and Trudeau says 
No, 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 no. You know, the Bank of Canada, which I think he runs around with them in his hip pocket. The Bank of Canada says it's less than half of 1% that it, that is caused, but it's a fraction. I, what it, I think the last time Tiff Macklin top, talked about it, he said it was 0.15% was, uh, yeah. of inflation was the carbon tax. It's not. Because, as you said, by the time you add it in to your groceries, because everything that's trucked to your grocery store pays carbon tax. By the time you add it in to any other thing that you, the building material, say you, you're doing a reno in your house and you brought in some drywall. Well, that drywall had to come somewhere. And the trucker who brought that drywall added on a cost to the drywalling company for the carbon tax. And it just, it filters its way through the entire economy, and now we're seeing in Saskatchewan just taking it off, just taking it off home heating in Saskatchewan, which is mostly natural gas. There, there are over 80% of homes in Saskatchewan are, are heated by natural gas. Just taking it off home heating r- reduced their uh, car, reduced their inflation rate in Saskatchewan in February by more than a third. Amazing. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, Sylvain Charlebois, the food professor. Um, it was him and, and not any media outlet in this country that when Tiff Macklem claimed the carbon tax did not impact inflation at all, that it was just such a minuscule number, Sylvain Charlebois said, mm, I don't think so. And he persistently wrote to the Bank of Canada to say, how did you come to this calculation? Mm-hmm. And I forget which items it was on, but they only considered, I think, three items that the carbon tax was on. Mm-hmm. It, it was a ridiculous calculation, it, you know, not something worthy of, uh, you know, an organization like the Bank of Canada, but that's what they did. Um, the fight over the carbon tax isn't the only chaos we've been seeing in the House of Commons of late. Um, Lauren, I, uh, I, I spent a long time physically on Parliament Hill covering this stuff. And, and then, you know, a bunch of years since going back and forth and especially during the pandemic, remotely watching. Um, I struggled to find something as chaotic as what we saw last Monday on the vote on the NDP motion regarding Israel, Gaza, and Hamas. Uh, I I think same-sex marriage would be close back in 2005, and, and I can describe what that was like if you want, but do you remember anything so chaotic with the government standing up at 713 to read 14 different amendments into a motion that they're supposed to uh, vote on at 7.15. Yeah, no, I don't. And even with the same-sex marriage uh, votes, that was stretched out over a period of uh, several days. This was, you know, jammed in at the very last minute and, and nobody, I think to this day, we're now, we're now looking at three days after that vote. Uh, I still think there are an awful lot of people who are scratching their heads at just what the amendments mean and what that what what Canada's foreign policy should look like as a as a byproduct of this vote it, it really is that chaotic you you have a government that has both uh, a, a traditional base among Jewish voters and is desperately trying to woo Muslim voters who outnumber Jewish voters by about six to one in Canada right now Mm-hmm. And so they they're they're like a Mississippi bullfrog sitting on a hollow stump. You know, they 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 don't know which way to jump. They they don't they they want to because they're progressives. They want to show their support for uh Palestinians, but because they are desperate for any vote they can have and 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 their their traditional base of of uh candidate recruitment and organizational skill and things is is it has an awful lot of Jewish members. Uh, they don't want to set them off either. But but now you've seen it, as, as you see with the Liberal MP uh, uh, Housefather. Anthony Housefather, yeah. Anthony Housefather. Uh, they have really alienated, I think, they've really alienated the, the Jewish community in Canada because there is no other way for me to interpret. Like you, I've, I've seen people reading the tea leaves from this motion for the last three days. But for me... The one message this sends, because you can you can look at the minutia and you say, well, it says this, but it also says this. And the minutia for me, it says it, it is unimportant because what it basically says is, look, we are prepared to forgive Hamas for what they did to Israelis on October seventh, 
please just desperately vote for us and the Liberal Party. Um, and, uh, you know, it was an NDP motion. Uh, exactly. I guess the Liberals did rewrite it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, they, you know, it, 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 the, the Palestinian cause has become one of several litmus tests for the progressives in Canadian politics. You, you aren't truly progressive unless you see systemic discrimination everywhere. You aren't truly progressive unless you believe every story about unmarked graves at residential old residential school sites. You aren't truly progressive unless you buy into electric vehicles and heat pumps and climate disaster without questioning any of it. And you aren't truly progressive unless you stand in solidarity with the Palestinians and you believe everything they say about we're oppressed, we are occupied by Israel, uh, there is apartheid going on, we are the victims of genocide. Unless you are prepared to, uh, to, to, to accept all of that unconditionally, then you, you lose your membership in the alliance of Canadian progressives. Uh, and, and that's where the liberals are at, is that they, they have for 30 years bought the propaganda around the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is largely leans towards the Palestinian and Arab side. And, and so now they were left on, on Monday with this vote where they had to keep their progressive bona fides, uh, but also try and assuage uh, the, the, the Jewish vote in, in Montreal and Toronto. Well, mostly Montreal because they, they've got one seat in a, a riding with a significant Jewish population here in Toronto. Um, I, I guess they've got a couple. They've got Marco Mendicino and Yara Sachs. And um, I'll tell you that I think both of them will be unemployed come the next election. I don't see either one of them winning. It's absolutely incredible to watch. Uh, we had Anthony House father on the podcast a few weeks ago asking him about you know, how are you still in the Liberal Party? Yeah, I've known Anthony a long time, uh, yeah. more than 20 years. I, I, he, you know, all this talk of him being, a, you know, Willie Cross to the Conservatives. He's not a Conservative. No, um, no. He's very much a, a Liberal, but he's disappointed in his own party. And that can happen to people in and, any and he's not And he's party. not a one-issue He's not a one issue politician. I mean, you, no. If you, you've seen up close American politics enough to know that out of 435 members of the House of Representatives, some of those districts are so small and so homogenous that you can have members of the House of Representatives, congressmen, who are kind of one issue. But House Father wouldn't fit in that in, in the United States. He doesn't fit in it here. He's not a one-issue guy. I can't imagine him crossing the but, floor. But he, he, he could sit as an independent, you know. And, he could. And who knows, by the time this is posted, maybe something will happen. But, you know, he's been disappointed on English language rights by his own party mm -hmm. because the liberals, after championing that cause, I mean, when I lived in uh, Montreal, I, I, I used to, Thank God for uh, Jean Chrétien actually standing mm -hmm. up to all the separatist language crazy nonsense. Yep. Um, but Trudeau has abandoned that. Um, so is every other party, by the way. But now they've also abandoned him on Israel. And so that becomes very difficult for, for someone to deal with. But in you know the, the Jewish Canadian community, people that I'm hearing from in the Toronto area, they feel betrayed. Yes. by this vote. Yes. They feel utterly betrayed and alone because the anti-Semitism is through the roof. You've got that cartoon yes. in La Presse. You've got a Hamilton uh, movie theater deciding that they're going to cancel a Jewish film festival that they'd agreed to months ago because uh, people are threatening them. You, know, you, you can't allow Jews to have movies or we'll come for you. Uh, that's pretty frightening. Um, you, you've got uh, a, a Toronto city councillor shouted down while they're discussing the FIFA World Cup. They're not even discussing these issues, but the p protesters showed up to yell at James Pasternak well, because he's Jewish. You yeah. know, it, the mask the is off. The most disturbing one to me was when protesters blocked the entrance to hospitals uh, in Toronto uh, and set off fire bombs and, or smoke bombs, I mean, and... Uh, it, there, there was a fire bomb of a deli. Yes. Yes, but the, the the protests I'm thinking of at the hospitals, at Mount Sinai yep. Hospital in Toronto, involve smoke bombs and people jumping up on the entrance and 
and then uh, with megaphones and shouting anti-Israeli slogans, which are anti-Semitic too. I mean, you, you, you cannot tell me because the people who utter those sentences mean them to be anti-Semitic. You can't tell me that the phrase like from the river to the sea but is not it, anti-Semitic because it is. It, they're on the, uh, the bullhorn shouting, we are the Intifada at a hospital. Exactly. And, and you know, you, okay, so you go and you park your 18-wheeler in downtown Ottawa and honk your horn for three weeks. They call out the Emergencies Act on you and they seize your bank account. I don't see any of that going on with these anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic, very violent rhetoric uh, protests in favor of Palestine. I, nobody says, oh, you know. The prime minister doesn't say these are a fringe element with unacceptable views. He doesn't say that these are un-Canadian actions. He didn't say any of that. But he did say that about uh, about truckers. You know, I, th- yeah. this party just does not, the Liberal Party just does not know where to go on on the Is- Israel-Palestine issue. It just doesn't. I, yeah, I've been walking with the... Uh, they call themselves pro-Palestinian. After walking with them since October 9th, I call them pro-Hamas protesters. Mm-hmm. I've never heard them once call for the release of the hostages. Nope. I've never once heard them say Hamas should stop using Palestinians as human shields. I've never once heard them say Hamas should stop stealing the aid that's delivered to Gaza. Did, did they know. condemn the October 7th butchery? No. No, no none of no, that they has celebrated ever happened. It. Exactly. They celebrated it. They showed up on October 9th in downtown Toronto, including a sitting uh, New Democrat MPP who yes, who's was eventually been... thrown out of her, her NDP oh, caucus, yep. uh, Sarah Jama. Um, she, uh, they showed up to celebrate what happened on October 7th. And, and you, if you're going to be chanting there's only yep. one solution, Intifada revolution, two days after what happened, and Israel hasn't even responded yet, well, we know what you're saying, and we know what you're celebrating, and, and you're claiming to be peaceful. No, you're you're not peaceful. You're no, you're no, celebrating and, and, the revolution. And North American and Western European progressives can delude themselves into thinking that you know, talking about intifada and revolution and independence, and you know, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. You you can delude yourself into thinking that that simply means equal rights for Palestinians and Israelis and a peaceful two-state solution, blah, blah, blah. None of the people who say those things at the protests mean that by it. No. What they mean is we need to wipe out, like it was, there was an imam in Montreal shortly after the October 7th uh, atrocities who said, we need to wipe out all the Jews. Allah, come he, he, please he, he and wipe out. called for God to do it. And, and that was his defense. Oh, I didn't call for that. I called for yeah. God to kill them all. Yeah. <laughs> what? No. So, so please don't tell me when you're voting in the House of Commons for a two-state solution and you're voting for recognition of a Palestinian state. Don't tell me, please, that what you're looking for is equal justice for both sides. You have taken a side that by its very nature calls for the other side to be eradicated. And and I have, you know, you and I both have talked about this before. We have a lot of Jewish friends, and they are staggered since October 7th by the level of anti-Semitism mm-hmm. that, that the, those attacks have provoked. Like they, they, they are stunned that most universities in, in Canada, the, the, a big percentage, I shouldn't say the majority, because we don't know what the silent majority says, but the most vocal minorities at most universities among the faculty are very pro-Palestinian and very anti-Israel to the extent where I think it's fair to say they're anti-Semitic. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I know an awful lot of Westerners, I don't mean Western Canadians, I mean people in Europe and North America, an awful lot of liberals and progressives in Western countries think it's possible to uh, criticize Israel but not be anti-Semitic. And that is true. But when you are siding with people whose very nature is to eradicate Jews and the state of Israel, I'm sorry, you, you, you don't get to draw those fine lines because the people you're supporting are not drawing those fine lines. I'll, I'll tell you how 
scared people are. Um, first off, just after uh, October 7th, uh, did a podcast with Ben Shapiro. And at that point, Ben said, uh, every Jew I know is getting a gun. Now, of course, mm -hmm. Ben lives in the United States of America. Pretty much everyone has a gun already. <laughs> but then I was at an event and a couple, uh, two guys came up to me, uh, two Jewish men, one whom I knew, one who I previously didn't know. And both of them wanted to thank me for the, uh, you know, the, the views put forward in the sun, in national post and post media in general. And in just say they, they appreciated it. And mm -hmm. then they both started talking about how they both signed up for their gun courses in Canada and that every person in their class was also Jewish because they they were so mm -hmm. afraid they yeah. felt they needed to do yeah. something. A couple and of I weeks can guarantee ago, you for every, for every one of those people in a gun class, there's three or four Jews who have gone out and bought guns who are not registering them, who aren't taking the, the PAL course uh, yeah. just because they feel threatened. I was uh, sitting in a cafe a couple of weeks ago, two young people telling me how they're trying to decide whether to stay in Canada. Is it safer to move mm -hmm. to South Florida or to move to Israel? Mm -hmm. And then a few days after that, I, I, I'm with uh, Deputy Conservative Leader Melissa Landsman in her riding, talking to the rabbis of the synagogues that were targeted. And they're saying that this is a big discussion in their own community. Is it even safe to be a Jew in Canada anymore? Mm -hmm. This motion, these cartoons, these actions yep. Yep. do nothing to help that. Well, and, uh, and look, yesterday the, the Toronto City Police, Toronto Police Service, uh, released its uh, numbers for hate crimes that have been committed yep. since October 7th. And almost 60% of them were against Jews. I mean, if you listen to the prime minister or to Melanie Jolie or, or any of the liberal cabinet ministers, you'd think that what we're really facing here is uh, anti-Islamic uh, rhetoric and hate. And it's not. It's not. I mean, I, I, sure, there's been some of that. And, it, and none of it is. And it's good. despicable. It, of course it is. But the vast majority of hate initiated incidents in Toronto, I'm assuming pretty much across the country, since October the 7th has been directed at the Jewish community. And no wonder they're feeling what they're, they're asking the question, are they safe in Canada anymore? Let me ask you about this motion because it's, we're, we're getting mixed messages over mm -hmm. what the motion actually means. Mm -hmm. We kind of discussed that. Um, the fact that they took out the part of recognizing, officially recognizing the state mm -hmm. of Palestine, um, Okay, good. Still don't like the motion. But there was the, the part that said cease all future uh, transfers of military goods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I looked at the numbers. We've given like 40,000 rounds of artillery shells, um, 150 millimeter artillery shells to Ukraine. We just gave it to them. We gave mm -hmm. them four howitzers. We've given them eight Leopard 2 tanks. We've given them 10,000 rounds yeah. of 105 uh, uh, tank uh, artillery mm -hmm. ammunition, uh, $10 million of small arms, you know, so pistols, uh, infantry rifles, sniper rifles. And this is all good. We've given Israel nothing on the military side. They were buying some limited amount, mm -hmm. but some from Canadian firms. Mm -hmm. And we've now essentially said, you're getting nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if effectively the way they're talking the Israeli government could not buy boots if there was a Canadian manufacturer for army boots or ration packs. And, yep. you know, Canadian ration packs used to feed a lot of the Western armies of the world. Uh, and, and now we're saying, no, if there's a military use, you can't have it. It is it. We've got two Democratic allies um, in at war. Both have been invaded. Mm -hmm. One is being treated in a vastly different manner than the other. And to yep. me, it's yep. all due to demographics and votes. 1.3 million Ukrainian Canadians, 1.8 million Muslim Canadians, 335,000 Canadian Jews. Good. I think, I think that's absolutely right. I think every calculation that the liberal government makes, whether they are conscious about this or not, is predicated on whether or not it will get them reelected. They are nothing but an election machine. They can't, or I used to have a guy I worked with on Parliament Hill who said, these people couldn't organize flatulence at a bean dinner. 
Um, I mean, as, as a government, they can't do anything. You have the the parliamentary budget officer who said the other day that the front, er, the average frontline federal worker has seven bosses. No wonder they can't get anything done. It's it's paralysis through management. They have so many levels of management managers they can't do anything. So they are uh, incompetent. So the only thing that makes any sense to them when they're looking at a policy is whether or not it will get them reelected, uh, because. Ultimately, they don't really care what they do with power. They just have to have the power. And and I, I think that's why we're sending you – know, I, I was chuckling when you were talking about the, the, the shopping list we were sending to Ukraine because even it's pathetic. We don't have anything to send them. Uh, you know, we, we, well, had we, to we have your, three days of munitions in this right. country if yeah. we were invaded. Three days yeah. and, 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 and we'd be able to NATO rule is 30 days. Um, and so we don't have anywhere close to the NATO rule that we're supposed to have. But, you know, we have to rummage around. I don't know what the state, the leopard tanks are that we sent to them. But at one point we said, well, we have 90 some tanks, but there's really only four of them that are in working order. Well, like, hello. You know, this is this is pathetic. I mean, we announced the other day that that we no longer have trainer jets so that we're going to have to send all of our young fighter pilots to Italy or Finland or Texas to learn how to fly jets. I mean, with the, so what we're sending to Ukraine, I don't know, it, it, they probably got it out of the, the uh, war museum in Ottawa and sent it over there because they had to send them something. But, but they, even that is much better than what they're prepared to give to Israel. And I, I mean, I think and Israel's are... not even asking for anything, though. No. Israel wants to buy. In fact, there was a piece in the Jerusalem yeah. Post after uh, they announced that we're, we're not going to sell anything to Israel if the military can use it. There was a piece in the Jerusalem Post about how, well, while Canada bans the Israeli military from uh, buying from Canada, here's all the things the Canadian military has been buying from Israel over the last several years. And it was a pretty extensive list. Well, and, and look at all of the, the uh, inter-force cooperation we've had since the Liberals came to power with the Chinese, with the, with the, 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 the uh, People's Army, uh, the People's Liberation Army of China. You know, I, they, they would turn on us in an instant. The Israelis would be there to the very last to help defend us. I think there are three canaries in democracy's coal mine. Israel is one of them. If it doesn't survive, I'm not sure that democracy survives everywhere. Ukraine is another one, and I think we're losing our interest in helping Ukraine, which is dangerous because it just sends the signals to people like Putin that they can invade democracies uh, at will, and we're not going to do much about it. And the third one that hasn't turned hot yet but could at some point is Taiwan. And if we're not prepared to, to help Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, then we're showing we don't have a lot of commitment to democracy. And Maybe progressives and, and, and Canadians at large don't see it that way, but I guarantee you the rest of the world does. If we are not prepared to help people who have the same political values that we do, then the, uh, the, the people in the world who would do us ill uh, take that as a signal. They know, what, they know what they'd face if they attacked us or an ally, a close ally. Okay, then I'll leave you with this. Uh put what you just said through the lens of the NDP motion that the Liberals backed at the last minute in a night of chaos, and what message are we sending? I think that's exactly the message we're sending, is that we're, like, what is it that the NDP wanted to glorify in Palestine? Was it the human rights record? Was it the fact that there hasn't been an election in any Palestinian territory in over 20 years, so they're not committed to democracy. There is no particular court system. There's no rule of law. There aren't equality for women or LGBTQ members. Like, what is it about Palestine that, that the NDP think, and the liberals too, a lot of liberals, think is worth celebrating? Like, they, they, they don't share any of our political values, and yet somehow they've become this mascot for tolerance and progressivism. And, and so if you're not in favor of Palestinian rights, then you're not progressive. That to me is 
utter rubbish. If, if you're not in favor of Israel defending itself and its democracy and, and its Supreme Court, and, you know, the Supreme Court has been at war with the, the, the majority in the Knesset now for about three years over whether or not the Supreme Court has the right to read in rights to legislation. That's what a democracy does. A democracy does not send people over the wall on October the 7th and slaughter babies and teenagers and defenseless women and seniors and, and then go back to Gaza and celebrate that, that, what it is that you want to support for, from the NDP. I simply cannot fathom. And why the liberals decided to sign up to it, especially the cabinet, yep. I don't know. Lauren, we'll, we'll leave it at there. Great chat. As always, thank you very much. You can Terrific. read Lauren in the Edmonton Sun, the Toronto Sun, across Post Media. Uh, full Comment is a Post Media podcast. My name is Brian Lilly, your host. This episode was produced by Andre Fruit with theme music by Bryce Hall. Kevin Libin is the executive producer. You can subscribe to Full Comment. Please do. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Leave a review, a comment, what have you. Share this on social media. Email your Aunt May and Whitby about it. Let people know. And... Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Brian Lilly.